From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. In this episode of Fragmented, we continue with part two of our Arrow episode. If you haven't listened to the last episode, which would be episode 120, then I highly suggest you listen to that one first. It'll just help provide more context. In this one, we dive into the details of the Arrow library. Uh, What purpose does Arrow serve in the land of Kotlin? How it helps bring many of the functional paradigms of programming to your daily development? Uh, We also talk to the team about how it all started, the history of the library, why do we even need Arrow, how Arrow is structured, some of the pitfalls, and in the end, some resources that should help you get started if you're interested in using Arrow in your Android development. This concludes our two-part series and is most definitely an episode worth listening, so I hope you enjoy the show. Many thanks to Microsoft for sponsoring this episode to promote App Center. It's a continuous integration, delivery, and feedback suite of cloud services for Android apps that's just going to make you more happier than you could ever be happy. With App Center, you can automate your Android app development lifecycle. You can build, test, distribute, monitor, and push, oh man, to ship five-star higher quality apps faster and with more confidence than ever. Man, that gets me excited. Building a development pipeline for your Android apps has always been a challenge, but with App Center, you can get started in minutes. That's right. Simply connect your GitHub and Bitbucket repos and build right there in the cloud. Test on thousands of real Android devices. I'm talking the real ones. You press your buttons on the clickety-click, the tappity-tap kind. Then you're going to distribute that to beta testers and Google Play, and you can monitor real-world usage with crash and analytics data. Mm -hmm. As a fully modular suite of services, you can pick and choose the service you need and connect it to the tools you already use. You know that sounds good. Sign up now on appcenter.ms. That's right, sign up now at appcenter.ms and spend less time managing your app lifecycle and more time coding. Clickety clickety clackety clackety. Semicolon. Now forget that we write Kotlin. No semicolons needed. Thanks, Microsoft. Do yourself a favor. Try App Center. AppCenter.ms. This is all right. Tons of fantastic information here, and, and I really appreciate you folks kind of breaking down some of the basics here. But the real reason why we're here to talk about is. Kotlin Arrow, and it's the library that you folks are responsible for creating here. And so I'm kind of wondering, what is Kotlin Arrow, how, and how does it help us as developers in a functional programming world? And what does it do? It'd be fantastic if you guys can kind of give us the so elevator pitch. So Arrow exists when, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of it. So mm-hmm. we, we, were, sure. we were trying to have these classes, this discussion about functional programming, all these same concepts that we're discussing right now internally in like our, our, our Slack, the, the place where, where we usually talk. And Raul was teaching us about it. And he's like, I'm going to refactor a project. I'm going to start extracting some, uh, you know, common functional patterns like this map, reduce, you know, traverse and everything else. And I'm going to put them in like a small library. And from that library, uh, we realized that maybe we can scale it a little bit larger. We can make it into like more constructs and more ideas. And at some point it was like, shit, we can just ship this. We can just like make (laughs) (laughs) a whole whole thing out of it. Like uh, we had to solve a couple of technical problems about some of the, uh, some of the constructs that are a little bit more advanced, but overall it was just like, oh my God, we can have the same style, the same coding style that we have. Uh, we can bring some of the libraries, we can bring all the same ideas into Kotlin world. And we can do that on mobile. It's like, oh my God, this is this is amazing. This is really cool. So uh, several months after that, uh, we've been working on this. Uh, we got uh, several messages from like people from JetBrains, Hadi, and, and it's like, okay, so there's now functionality on one side, there's category on the other. What were these two different libraries? Is that you guys had two different libraries at one point? Yeah, or there what? used to be two libraries. One of them was category, the one that okay. we were working on, and the other one was functionality, which is the one um, Mario was working on and had been uh, working on since like I don't know, 2014 or something like that. So oh, wow. that library had uh, okay, had okay. already a lot of the concepts, or it complemented our library really well. So um, somebody like the people from JetBrains, like, okay, 
how about you just talk it out? We don't want the community to be split. We want to have a single library and we want to have all the concepts as like everything else uh, so the community understands. And we just chatted it out like Ra Raul did most of the work with, uh, with it and um, Mario was completely on board. I think he was a really good idea and we could complement each other's ideas really well. So we put the libraries together and at the beginning of the year, we just announced that we're going to release Arrow, which is a single, a single library or a single core library for the whole ecosystem in a way that is not split across like uh, functionality and category and people have to decide basically. Oh, so you basically combined, combined forces and, and now here we are exactly. with Arrow, correct? And we also wanted to avoid a situation similar to what's happened uh, in the Scala community where there is Cats and Scala set and then people, those are kind of foundation libraries. So when people build new projects they have, and they're functional, they need to decide whether they go with uh, Cats or Scala set. It's like having basically two standard libraries in a way. We don't want that to happen in Kotlin. So we talked to Mario and he was all on board. To make this happen for the this community. shows so much maturity in like your thinking and we yeah i'm pretty sure the mm -hmm. community thanks all of you for like having done this because it's like these are actually the hard problems right like coming up i the worst thing you can think of is like these two beautiful concepts existing but like you know going in parallel right uh, but the fact that you all could like you know meet minds and like bring it all together i'm I'm 100% sure like the community appreciates it because now there's only just one thing we need to learn, right? Versus, oh, functional yeah. does it this way, category does this this way, but like one thing is done in this way in like one library. So like a lot of that, thank you so much for like, you know, handling a lot of that. Quick question, to kind of a, a meta question that the folks just kind of love to know the background info on is where where did the name Arrow come from and how did yeah. it come to be? I imagine it was not inspired from like a late TV show watching of the show. <laughs> no. Okay. Just, just, just want to make, no. make it clear. <laughs> not really. Not really. So, yeah. Arrow came from uh, basically, so we were before category and then functionality. So we thought that it wouldn't make sense to keep one of the names because otherwise, you know, uh, 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 the other community would be a little alienated with the merch. So we decided to come up with a new name. And arrow itself, uh, an arrow in, in category theory, uh, it, it's a, a concept uh, as part of the theory, and also it's a uh, relates to the morphisms between objects in the categories. So it's commonly, uh, you know, associated with functional programming. Doesn't have any special meaning. It's not related to the function arrow syntax, but mm -hmm. uh, it's just like a name that catches on on functional programming in a way. And also we use the symbol, the uppercase lambda, uh, on the A when we try to like advertise mm -hmm. it. And that's actually because that is the symbol of the typed functional programming, which is the style uh, specific that we do in, in Kotlin with, uh, you know, uh, a lot of types and, and the help of the compiler versus just uh, functional programming as you may have seen in other languages like JavaScript or dynamic languages that has no types. I had one quick uh, question, follow-up question to like uh, Kotlin Arrow at this point, right? So for someone who's coming in, right, you... Is is it fair to say that the reason Arrow exists today is in order to enable the functional programming concepts uh, better? Like, why do I need Arrow? Like, I think that's like a more generic question, right? Because I yeah. think we can do some levels of functional programming. We are already doing it. Uh, we have things mm -hmm. like Rx Java. So why do I need Arrow then? Like, why? What does Arrow help bring that I don't already have? So there are two different there are two different levels you can work on. Um, observable is a really powerful construct. It's super powerful. It's all knowing. You know, it does many many things. And sometimes you need something that is smaller. You need something like optional. You need something like either. You need these uh, smaller ideas that. Uh, you know, you can you can just pepper around your program, and and they don't feel like heavyweight, or they don't have to learn about operators or anything of the sort, mm -hmm. because they are they only they only want to split the state or or, or make a branching in a function, or uh, you know put in a, on a data class that a value is not available. So those ones we provide right off the bat. That's your entry point to the Arrow uh, library in general. So you just add the library, you start using try instead of uh, you start using our data type data type try instead of try catch. So you can encapsulate those functions that throw exceptions and everything else. And then you just get accustomed to like the operators like map and flat map and, and you know, and traverse and everything else. So all of that is just provided to you. That's fine. That's a, that's not a long library to write. 
Right, Now, right. if you want to scale that into become an architecture, into have something that is like a larger functional program with functional para with a really functional paradigm for the architecture and everything else, you start needing other constru other constructs and other ideas about around abstraction. So we are providing those abstractions for as a core for other libraries to um, to build on. Oh, so you need, also, you need to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say also, in addition to what everything that Paco has said, which is one of the biggest, uh, you know, selling points for Aero, Aero also provides uh, ad hoc polymorphism in, in Kotlin. And what that means is that with Aero, you can write programs that are targeting uh, data types in an abstract way. For example, you can write a program that folds, map, flat maps, does everything that you need to do your computation but it's not tied to any specific data type. So your entire polymorphic program can be run to observable, IO, deferred from called the next coroutines. You don't need to get married to any framework. Oh, you just wow. declare everything as polymorphic. And that's oh. that's something that error brings to the table that wasn't um, possible in Kotlin uh, before. And that's on a technique that is frequently used uh, in languages like Scala that have like higher kind of types and other language features that allow this type of uh, programming. So in addition to all the good data types and everything for the vanilla functional programming style, uh, Aero also allows you to do ad hoc polymorphism in, in Kotlin. So you can you can use this core, these, these abstractions to create libraries. Right now we have a whole ecosystem of Rx libraries that are based on observables. What if you could just change from observable to defer just by changing uh, you know the call point and saying, "Hey, I want to. I want these abstractions to actually use the the mechanics of coroutines so the mechanics of IO um, instead of observable." So we could have an ecosystem of libraries that are generic enough, and uh, you can just concrete uh, add the concrete implementation in your program. And that's the that's the style and that's the core that Arrow brings to the table. That's why we want to enable other other library makers and other users to do. Wow, that's that's fascinating. I had. Two quick follow-up questions. Uh, one is you mentioned in between about uh, making this easier and sort of like introducing like these functional paradigms, right? Is there like a performance implication per se? Like, uh, is that a focus for like the Arrow library in that like you want to be able to enable functional programming while looking specifically at performance? Uh, that was one question. Uh, maybe we can like get to that and then I can ask the other question later. Um, yeah, so this, uh, this is a super easy, simple question. Um, we are just defining the program. We're just creating this data structure, this definition of the program, the same way that you define it with observables right now. The difference is right now you can interpret that with observables or with something else. So we have the same performance as observable, as deferred, as everything else. We're just having a couple more layers of indirection that allows you to make the program generic. So we, we, use, dele we use like delegation. So we are delegating back to observables for the operations. We're just, you know, you... Uh, we are just providing the interfaces that say, hey, and this observable is going to be able to do flat map, for example, and then it's going to delegate into the actual implementation of observable. So it's going to be as fast as observable plus one layer of indirection or two layers of indirection. So you mentioned that you folks like work with JetBrains and JetBrains suggested that you merge these communities, right? Is there a thinking that eventually Kotlin will just get this merged in like will it, will it have like arrow sort of like merged in <laughs> is that the idea or is it more like well once you want to like up your game then you start using arrow like how, how, what is the thinking there i'm just curious i don't think in the foreseeable future uh codlin will get the instructions that arrow has and i think the reason <laughs> is because you know codlin is a is a language similar to sky in the sense of it enables functional programming but it also caters an entire community of non-functional programmers which a right. lot of these concepts are foreign to, or they don't even are interested in, mm -hmm. you know, using them, and, and that's uh, that's fine. And and for that reason, I think uh, the language itself may be interested in some of the features that empower some of the techniques that you want to promote. Right. Like what we're proposing for type classes. So we have a proposal now for the Kotlin compiler that Forty Seven Degrees is working on, and some members of the community, and that's gonna attempt to bring type classes to the Kotlin compiler. So that's a feature that potentially Kotlin may want to have. That doesn't mean that Kotlin will introduce like Functor or Monad as uh, actual type classes on the standard library in a way, right? But who knows? You know, the future may change. People may change their mind. <laughs> it's just still the beginnings <laughs> of functional programming, so. 
one of the things that I, w- I want to do before we get too much deeper into some of the things that, that Arrow provides is, is to kind of bridge the gap between I'm as a developer and, and I'm coming at this from a perspective of the person who's listening to the podcast, driving down the road or doing the dishes or whatever. And they're listening to the podcast and they think like, wow, all these concepts like purity and, and so forth sound really cool. Uh, and I'd like to use them, but I'm standing over here where my application is now. I see all the functional programming concepts and, and all the, the benefits way over there, really far away from me, but I have no idea how to bridge that gap to get to that. So how do I, given a current my current application skills, and I know about the Kotlin Arrow project, how do I actually start working and integrating this into my application so I can kind of start building my skills to become much more functional in my day-to-day Yeah, I think there are, there are many ways of starting with this, of course. But if you were really trying to start uh, learning about functional programming and you are new to this, I think it should be very uh, highly recommendable to take a look at the official Arrow documentation, which is actually very, very good, very detailed. You have There you have examples about real world use cases and problems that we find in, our, in a daily basis and how to solve them mm-hmm. using Arrow, like, for example, dependency injection or testing or error handling or things like that. So the documentation is very rich in that, and it even provides some videos uh, done by the 47 Degrees people, which are working really, really great. So I think it's a good way to, to start uh, diving into it. But also, if you really, really want to start using some concepts on your, on your apps, I will definitely recommend you to take a look at the most basic data types, because mm-hmm. there are data, data types like option, either even try uh, that are very, very easy to understand and apply very well to a lot of problems that we find every day, you know? Well, one thing that I noticed when I was like looking at Arrow at a larger level, right? And as I was like going through some of the docs and uh, trying to understand where it is, I noticed that Arrow is a uh, model, like the way Arrow is structured is in terms of like modules, right? Like everything seems to be like a module, which is very interesting. And I was curious if you could walk us through like what that approach is and like, how should I be reading into this? Does that mean like, oh, when I need something, I include the module? Are there like core modules that I should always be using? Can you like give us the rundown on the whole module structure? So in Arrow, we have different modules and and they're usually organized based on the use cases that people use Arrow for. So there's a few, uh, you know, people that are getting in, uh, into functional programming that are using try, option, uh, some of the most basic uh, data types. Mm-hmm. Those are in Arrow core. Nice. And, okay. uh, and that's a very small module that you can use just to, to get started. And then all the other modules are organized based on whether the data types are either more advanced or they're type class related. So depending on the functionality that you're going to need, uh, as you read through the documentation, there will be instructions. Uh, this thing is in this module, and mm-hmm. this is how you import it. And, and normally, functional programming libraries are not organized this way. They're modular, but not from the point of view of the artifact. So we right. do have a lot of different jars that you can include a la carte based on your needs. And that's mostly because, you know, in Android, people have concerns about library size and, and all those things. So we want to be conscious about many of our users being Android users. And for that reason, we're trying to keep the library as modular and as lightweight as uh, we can. Oh, fantastic. I like that idea. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You mentioned something uh, there, like some of the basic types like option, either, and try. I'd like to dive into those real quick just to kind of really solidify some of the concepts and that I've seen that kind of really help bring home some functional concepts for me. Would one of you like to explain kind of those three different types, such as option, either, and try, and maybe when you would use those? And that kind of might be a little bit of a gateway for some folks to try mm-hmm. out some some arrow concepts and yeah, dig in deeper. Yeah, I could with it. Uh, uh, first of all, option. Option is used to mo- to model the absence or, or presence of a value. So it will really play very good in the same way that we have been using the, the Kotlin question mark operator uh, to, to tag your nullable fields. But in this uh, in this case, we are talking about the data type from Arrow. So option is, is used to model that. When you have an operation that could potentially return something bad, uh, sometimes it could uh, return nothing. Uh, you're probably going to want to to use an option there. So, yeah, if you if you want to that uh, to make that function what we called before referentially transparent, you will mm-hmm. use a return type uh, uh, 
uh, of uh, the option the option type for that and uh, yeah if you talk about like referential transparency right like typically you don't want to be slapping on like a void or something that doesn't have like return type right so modeling the absence of something is important in that context mm-hmm. right basically exactly. in, in fp what we do is like your uh, your functions in your type signatures they should include everything that your program does mm-hmm. so the, okay. so so when, so when you read the signature you actually know what the function is doing you don't need to look at the function code to see how it's implemented and what it may be doing should be should be just enough to read the the function and now based on the shapes we know how to go from one place to another with the different functional combinators and type classes oh i i like that thinking there's one concept that is important and i don't think it's mentioned enough which is function totality which means uh, your function should be able to process all the possible inputs. And you and yeah, that's pretty much it. Like you should be able to process all the possible inputs. So when your inputs are optional, are uh, seal classes, are either, are these types, you have a finite number of them that are important. You tend to write functions where the actual content of the, of that is wrapped inside either is not important because you're just like, aggregating numbers so you're just like um i don't know modify uh, returning a new value for a user or something like that mm-hmm. so the actual content cannot throw an exception they cannot just go and like oh if this is more than ten thousand, then it's gonna throw an exception or if you sort you model each one of those cases within a seal class as the in, as the input and as the output so when you read the signature and you read oh this is like um you know a user calculation result and that's a seal class that actually has numbers more than 10,000 error numbers less than 10,000 uh, numbers like whatever Got it. you have all the possible options encoded at the type level in the signature and you don't cannot have incorrect inputs and your outputs are from a limited set basically oh that's so interesting like you mentioned this thing right like where all of that information is encoded in the type I think that is like a very important, like, yeah, that's not to be taken lightly, right? Yeah. So option is a generalization for a type that has either nothing or one value. Either is a generalization for a branching code. So when you have an if, if this value is more than 10,000, else do another thing. That's a branch. So that's two possible mm-hmm. values. It's the same with either. You have a left value and you have a right value. And when the user wants to run that either, wants to inspect that either, it's going to have to do a fold. It's going to have to look into both branches of execution and do something with them. And the user is forced to do that. And that's what's important about it because it's on the type. You need to deal with the potential uh, case of failure at some point. And that information never abandons your functions. Whereas with the exceptions, uh, you have to defensively re- uh, try to capture or catch anything because you don't know how like third-party libraries may be behaving if they don't return either, for example. But all oh. of these uh, options, either, try all of these data types. I think uh, uh, if, if users are interested in learning more about these people that are listening to the podcast, we have a section in the error documentation under patterns called error handling, mm-hmm. where each one of the mm-hmm. error handling data types is explained with the pros and cons, and also what the best strategies are for doing error handling without using exceptions. I was going to ask, oh, I mean, why? I mean, using an if is simple enough. Why do I have to bother with like all these things? But then, like you mentioned, a good follow-up point, which is essentially, in some ways, encoding it in the type forces the user to handle that, right? Because with yeah. using like mm-hmm. a simple if, I could just like not deal with it, right? But with either, like even if you want to like draw that data out, like it sort of in some ways enforces that, right? Yeah. One of the things that I'm I'm hearing Raul and everybody say here is that I can look at this this function definition, I can just basically look at the first line, the definition of it. I'm going to need these arguments. So what I'm passing in and here's my return type. And based upon just that information, I can know exactly what's going to happen within that function. And to me, if I'm, and this is, I'm not a functional programming person other than the, the tiny bits I've dabbled in. But if I have a system that's very functional, I feel like it's almost less cognitive load mm-hmm. on me. Like I can almost read this code a lot easier and not have to worry about hopping into that big method to figure out what all those different if blocks do. Would that be a correct assessment? And from your experience, is that what you've encountered as well? Is it less load on your mind? So if you come from a yes. Java... Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let, me, let, me, let me get it started. Let me get it started. You can, you can pick it up. Later. <laughs> so there's, there's, one, there's one common uh, meme or, or, or topic that happens a lot, which is like, oh, you know, if you read the type signatures, you're going to know. And then you have a signature that is a string 
that it takes three strings and returns another string and you can do whatever with them. So the whole point is that you, um, the ones that we provide in Arrow are, are well typed and they are understandable, the, the things that it could be, the things that they do with the data. If you try to make your own definitions, uh, it is on the on the function creator to put those types correctly. So again, if you put something that aggregates three three strings and it's just like a string, 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 you're not gonna be able to read that signature. You're never gonna understand, <laughs> right? You need the names. But if, if mm -hmm. you say like string beginning, separator, um, string, you know, suffix, and if they're just simple type aliases like type analysis over a string, you know better. Like, oh my yeah. God, yeah, yeah, this is going to be the suffix. This is going to be the uh, older stuff. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to even read the, like, the, um, the parameter name. You just have to read the, the parameter okay. type and then you understand, oh, this is actually a string suffix. And if I look at it, oh yeah, yeah, so it's just a simple string, but I know how it's going to be used. So it's a, there's a little bit of, of load on the, fun, on the function writer to make sure that the types are correctly put in. And as Java programmers, uh, or, uh, we are really used to just using these super basic types, this fixation with like, this is an integer, this is a string, this is, everything <laughs> is just like super basic types where, because we don't have type aliases. Now that you have type aliases, instead of saying ID integer, you can just say that ID is actually a user ID, which can be either a type alias, or in the, if in the future you want to do a refactor, you can make it into a data class that contains aggregated information. Oh. Very cool. So type aliases, for the listeners who don't know, is a mechanism of representing the same type, but basically just giving an alias to it, right? Which is basically giving it a nicer name. And so what I'm hearing is a large part of functional programming is also the ability to write like these functions that sort of clarify this tab, right? Like enforcing this function totality and like making it easy to represent that through the function is part of the art of functional programming, right? Is that fair? Exactly, yeah. yes. And also like it's completely normal that as you are learning, uh, the types will be sometimes overwhelming. So you see like <laughs> nested yes. types or, or more types that you are used to, and that's fine. And that's actually a good thing. So we, we should not never forget that the more we type and the more work we let the compiler do, the less work our runtime has to do in terms of like fiddling with uh, logic and, and code and then and the, the safer our code is gonna it's gonna be so the more you can type it the better interesting i like oh that is that is so interesting because yeah i mean the natural question would be like well i mean that's a lot of cognitive load like at this point what the hell am i doing right because it's like so confusing but <laughs> type aliases like sort of help save us in that and it actually like you can then take it even further right is what you're saying mm -hmm. one of the the things that that we has been said a few times in this conversation that I still kind of find confusing is the word or the words higher kinded types. And I may have pronounced that wrong. I'm not even sure. Um, what exactly are That those? question is a very uh, complex one and it's not that easy to answer. <laughs> but if we try to keep things simple, we can use a very simple example for that. Like uh, the list of T, for example. We all know this uh, list of T type, where the T type is, a, is a, a parametric type, so you can pass any concrete type to it, and it will return a list of int, for example, or a list of a string. So up to date, we are used to abstract over the T, but we are not really used to, uh, to abstract over the list type itself. And that's actually a possibility. I mean, and that's what uh, higher kinds enable. You should be able to define your type, your list of T type as a higher kind of the types list and T, and would be able to, and you would be able to abstract over both sides. And that enables you to a bunch of very high global abstractions styles that you can do on functional programming, like tagless final or even free monads, right? And maybe Raul wants to say something else about that. Sure. Uh, as uh, Jorge mentioned, really is the ability to write programs where you don't need to say what container they're based on. So if you can okay. write a program saying this is going to be a sequence operation and this is going to be a parallel operation and then it's going to do this other thing, if you can describe that in terms of behaviors, uh, which use type classes for that, uh, those containers, that, uh, that can be interpreted to say list or defer. And here, list and defer, if you look at them, they are a type that have a generic argument that, it's, uh, that you can fill in. But we can, when we can treat those as uh, as not that they apply type, not as a list of in or as a list of a string, but as a general list, then we can operate and we can create programs 
that are not constrained uh, to the concretion of the data type itself, like list or option. And that's what empowers Arrow to do things like you can create a library and then have it run to async or routines or observable from Rx2 or any of those data types. Why? Because observable, deferred, themselves as types, they all have a hole. And that hole, or the way we refer to that type with a hole, it's called higher kind of type meaning something that can wrap oh. something else. So if we can define programs in those terms, then we can write abstract programs that are not tied to data types. So to dive a little bit more into type classes, type classes are interfaces, are implemented as interfaces that define the behavior that data types like mm -hmm. observable, like try, like either do. So if you're able to define your program only with the interfaces, the same way that you normally do in, in like Java, if those interfaces define the behavior of these data types and we can also encode to the container, that means that you can make whole programs and, and like libraries and everything else that are abstract to the container. As long as you have an implementation, um, a way for the, um, for the container to implement that interface. And that's the, mm -hmm. the correlation when we say what a type class is. The type class is actually the definition. The type class laws are actually the tests that, 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 that uh, an implementation of that type class has to pass to be considered correct. And then you have an implementation of a type class for observable, which means you can define that anywhere. It just has to be an object that complies with the interface for the current value, for the generic value of observable container and any content of type A. So this is... Yeah, and when we yeah. say... Go sorry. ahead, sorry. No, no, finish, finish your thought. Yeah. Uh, when we say type classes, we also mean like in the context of, say, you know how to map a list, like we said earlier, or you know how to, you know, fold uh, another structure because those are uh, methods in, in the actual data types that you use in your APS, and that's fine. But type classes, for example, functor, generically define how, what, what map means and what shape it has. So if you're oh, so if okay. you if you're working with type classes like functor, applicative, monad, all of these common functional type classes, you have all the API that you use normally in your data types. Like you have flat map, you have map, you have all of those. So you can describe entire programs with only with only those behaviors, with only those interfaces. So now that's that the program is entirely described and composed. You can run the program to some data type that actually is able to implement those behaviors. For example, if your program uses flat map, which comes from Monad, that means that you can run your program to observable and to uh, defer. Why? Because defer and observable both can implement flat map. So through that indirection, the type classes, we can write programs that are not tied to any framework or, or data types. And even, even for cases like testing, we have like things that don't do anything that just return a value immediately. So you don't have to do this substitution. You don't have to play with like plugins. You don't have to use Mojito. You don't have to do any of that stuff because all the implementations are given by you or we have we provide default implementations on the Arrow library. And you can wrap any abstraction that you already have for Synchrony. If you use a task, uh, task base, um, I don't know, or any other library that may come in the future, we just need a small, a super thin adapter that implements map, flat map, and a couple more things. And then you can use the, all the same stuff that we had in our stack. Oh, that's oh wow! That sounds pretty cool. And I know there are like more recent posts that uh, some of you have written on like how this enables better testing and like even like the dependency injection stuff. So uh, yeah. Yeah. and I, I mm -hmm. can see how a lot of this is like slowly like how it ties to some of the other stuff. Now, just about, uh, I was just about to say that uh, it's it was probably one of my posts where I was mm -hmm. writing about how the use of higher kinds and. Uh, create or compose all your code uh, in a very declarative way, not based on concretions, but on abstractions, is enabling uh, you to provide the implementation details in a later moment in time. So that enables a lot uh, of mocking techniques that you can apply on your tests because your program is mm -hmm. completely defined in, uh, in a, an abstract way, right? right? So you can come later and provide the implementation details you need. And if it's stabs, mocks, or whatever, you can just provide those at that moment in time. The next question I had is, and this is an easy question I've, I hear, uh, can you explain Monads in exactly one sentence, please? What? <laughs> uh, okay. 
I've so a common question that most people always have is like, oh, what are monads? What the hell are monads? Nobody like understands. So I was hoping some. <laughs> it just it just it's just chainable. Just say chainable. Just and, chainable. You know. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. mo- mon- that, that's it really is. <laughs> so it's it's an abstraction, right? And the abstraction just says something that it's a there is a list of operations or computations that will happen in a sequential order. So for the second computation to happen, the first one needs to complete. And the reason is because if you look at the signature of flat map, you can mm-hmm. see there is a function there that takes you from, say, A to F of B. Mm-hmm. And that basically says that that A comes from the previous computation. So it needs to complete before you can compute the next one. So wh- when it's a monad useful, say you are modeling uh, multiple remote web services calls. And to call the second one, you need the results from the first one. So that flat yeah. map, that, that's what, what actually monad does. In contrast to, say, applicative, which uh, instead of being sequential, it models independent computation. So if you have two parallel calls to two different web services that they don't need to wait for each other, you can model that with applicative. But if they have the dependency in the order or in the result, Mm -hmm. then you have to use monad. So it's just an abstract interface to model that generically for all data types. Very cool. You know, I started this as a cheeky question, but I actually do understand it much better now. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> That's good. We've been explaining this a lot. A lot. <laughs> nice. So we are making a huge effort in Arrow in general for documentation. You've seen that uh, 47 Degrees is making uh, weekly videos explaining one of, the, one of the parts of the API, either a data type or a type class. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the, documenta- the documentation we have a bunch of libraries that are already using Arrow in production. We have uh, one that is called Ang, that is a compiler for snippets. Mm-hmm. So basically, when you have your documentation in a markdown file, you're able to compile some, uh, some of los- the snippets uh, against the library. So that's how we test that Arrow is working correctly and that the documentation is up to date. We also have Jorge's curse. I think he will, will want to talk about that. And also, Mario has written a book that he's going to be published, like, right now or, or in like in a couple of weeks. I don't know when this is yeah. going to be airing. Oh, wow. So documentation and explaining things is actually, once the core was done, which is done now, is it's our second largest like initiative. So, oh, wow. so yeah, there's a lot, there's been a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's good though, because that is the biggest challenge with functional programming, right? It's like just get, I'm pretty sure once people understand it, they'll be more than happy to use it. But I guess the idea is like, yeah, that's the challenge, right? So it's good to see that the focus is on like trying to explain this to people. So one of the things that Kaushik and I usually like to ask our guests anytime we're working with any type of uh, library technology, et cetera, is there's always got to be the good with the bad. Other than the, the confusing aspect that usually most people encounter in functional programming, are there any gotchas or caveats that we should know about in regards to Kotlin Arrow that you might be able to provide some guidance yeah. on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> first, first of all, I, I, would like to, I would like to highlight uh, that. It's obvious that a library like Arrow and the functional paradigm uh, brings to the table a, a very big learning curve for a lot of people because people is not really used to this. But I would really like to, to, to make people know that learning curves do not necessarily mean that something is bad or that, this, or that we shouldn't use it, right? You have a very good example of that, which would be Arex Java, for example, where we have had many problems in the past to understand, like years ago when we started all using it, it was a bit uh, overwhelming and so on. But in the end, it turned out to be really useful for the people and the community. Uh, we could say that community started to learn more and more gradually about it, and then they are using it professionally. So uh, when I when I when I look at functional programming, I say I, I really see the same thing. I really see people getting used to that in the future, and and at some point, uh, I think all these concepts that functional programming is solving, which are very generic concepts and we all need in a daily basis uh, are going to provide a lot of a lot of help to the people and people is going to be aware of that and are starting to 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 adopt it so from from my side 
what I can say is that Arrow is a library that is actually focused on solving those problems rather than creating more of them. So once you get once you get past the learning curve, like we have the things that we discussed before about um, how do you have these type classes being passed on into functions because they are they're supposed to be available like at the scope and everything else. So we create like reader monad, which is a way of injecting functions. So we create this type classless style that I wrote a, a little bit about when you say, hey, I have problems with like immutable data structures because they have either, they have values, they have optional, and, and you know, I cannot update it or it's really difficult. We have a whole library called Optics and that does all these uh, immutable changes that you can, you can uh, update really nested data structures for you. Oh, wow. Uh, if, okay. you, if you have, yeah, if you have a lot of boilerplate code that you say, hey, I want to be able to generate uh, uh, type class definitions because we already have some idea of how they are going to look like the boilerplate code for, uh, I don't know, libraries um, that are coming out in the future. I don't know if I would want to talk about them. So <laughs> all these things, yeah, it's actually, that's what we are trying to solve. So Functional has some rough edges, and Arrow is there to solve them. It's not there to just add a little bit more to the complexity. It's actually mm-hmm. just to uh, um, subtract from it, basically. If I may say, uh, also, I mean, I think it would be fair to, to come into, like, what these are some of the limitations or kind of like problems that people may find in terms of like education or learning about FP in general too. But in the case of Arrow, the technical limitations or what we can see they're non-optimal at the moment, it's uh, the lack of the language support for higher kind of types and type classes. So we have a couple of mechanisms to, to do that. So higher kind of types in Arrow are emulated and uh, and that, that, that includes a, a little... Uh, of verbosity in the code when you declare them or the techniques uh, that you use. The, we use uh, annotation processors to code gen that boilerplate for you if you mm-hmm. want to. Mm-hmm. But that's something that other people in languages like Scala or languages that have higher kind of types and type classes don't face. So there is that extra kind of like nuance there, but n- something that can potentially change if uh, if the type classes uh, keep 87 proposal is accepted in the Called the programming language. I was going to ask that. Thing, <laughs> I was going to ask that. So if yeah. if you wanted to gently nudge people to get something there, uh, we'll make sure. Like if you give us a link, we'll you know you can ask our listeners. Yeah, if, we'll, we'll yeah. give you a link. People can take a look at the proposal. Suggest uh, changes. We're still uh, in between the sign and implementation phase. And the mm-hmm. other thing I wanted to like I give a shout out to Simon for the great work he's done with the optics library, as uh, Paco was mentioning. Very it's nice. been a tremendous effort. Very cool, very cool. Uh, one quick follow-up with uh, respect to caveats that I had is, is performance something, because I'm an Android developer, right? Don's an Android developer, and like a lot, a lot of our yeah. listeners are Android developers. Is this even something we should be considering? Like Because a large part of the, you know, the ding against functional programming is it generates a lot of garbage, there's a lot of classes, there's a lot of like extra stuff that's happening. Is this something that I really should be worried about? Is performance something that might uh, be affected by me using this? Not at all. No. no, no. I was just gonna say, like, not at all, because like we do bo- uh, both uh, keep an eye on performance in terms of uh, implementations. So mm-hmm. if we do have to use underneath a local mutability or things that are not pure, just to achieve uh, performance, we make those sacrifices. We are a pragmatic library. We're not just a academic style library proving concepts. So, so that's important to us. Performance in one side. And then on the other side, like as Paco mentioned earlier, the, the wrapping we do over data types and, and things is just one level of uh, indirection. So in my opinion, there should not be a performance concern at all. The, um, the performance issues that you can have on Android are generally on your rendering path, right? So when you're doing operations on your main thread and, and um, you know, you're making something that is really slow, which is understandable, but it's the same problem that RxJava has, right? It has an internal machinery that is actually very imperative, very mutable. Uh, you know, it has all these this ideas, so, so it can be used. And for us, it's the same. Like, it, maybe the high-level constructs are functional, they are, like, perfectly pure and everything else, but when we want to dig down, uh, dig down a little bit into performance with the stuff like um, effects, like the I.O. implementation and everything else, we are actually using this core of, like, really imperative, um, efficient code. So that's not a problem. The second thing is you're just having like rendering, you just have like rendering instructions, right? Same as in RX, same as in Redux, in Flux, and all this kind of like unidirectional UI updates. Right. 
And those are not happening 60 times a second, the same as a rendering loop. Those are happening on a user interaction, upon screen changes, or maybe they are just done every 100 milliseconds or something like that. If you create 100 objects every 100 milliseconds, I think Java, the JVM, can perfectly cope with all of that, if you know what I mean. So you're never, you're never going to create tens of thousands. And if you're creating tens of thousands, then maybe you should just go and change and have this one single method that actually internally, like internally has a lot of mutable state, but it's limited to the scope of a single method. That's what I mean. So you can have the referral transparency, you can have the purity, it's just a scope. Nobody said anything about that. So if you have immutability inside of method or even inside a single thread, like that's somewhat okay. That's somewhat, it's not frownable because we understand that performance is also important. All right. At this point, I want to ask if any of you had any finishing thoughts. Is there anything that before we part ways, is there something that you wanted to tell our listeners about Arrow? Is there something else that we should maybe like bring up? Anything, any interesting information about Arrow coming up in the horizon? Yeah, so I I mentioned this role. So Arrow is supposed to be a core library. Uh, we have a, we have a core, core we have a core set of components of abstractions that we are enabling for all the people to build upon. So that means that people have been traditionally doing um, Scala or Haskell or something like that. They already have a set of libraries. They already have a set of constructs that they have been using, and they have been going like really well for them. So once the core is done, we're working on the documentation and we're starting to get interest from people from other companies, from, from like larger companies that have been doing Scala backends and all those things to bring some of those ideas in. I know Raul and 47 Degrees right now are working or at least on a JSON parsing library that is based on annotation processing, no reflection, super fast, and another one that is being done for like network fetches, requests, and parallelism, caching, and everything else. And those ones are back-end level, yeah, they are back-end level constructs, something that people have been using uh, for a long while, and we want we can have those in Kotlin right now, and we can have the same advantages and everything else. So it is not a single library that exists to provide you either and try. It's an ecosystem that we want to grow with help of many other people. So we are happy to help. We're going to get involved. We solve many, many questions through the day. We're just really active in, in development and everything else. So just just come to, just come talk to us. Like uh, we're super happy to help everybody. We we just we just want to grow this this part of the ecosystem. And I think we can we can make our lives easier, like for everybody in the under community, and and we can shake up things a little bit for the better, not just for the sake of it. So, for the folks out there that are listening that want to get going in with Kotlin functional programming and so forth. What resources would you share with them so they can kind of kick off their, their learning journey? Uh, I think that the most obvious one is the official documentation where there, we have put a lot of effort on details, patterns, and so on, so on. So it's really highly recommended. Um, I would also love to mention the, the caster.io course that I published uh, recently about functional programming mm-hmm. using Arrow for uh, mostly focused on Android uh, problems. Um, yeah, maybe there are also some very interesting posts on the on Paco Paco blog about the uh, dependency injections and different approaches to 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 get it done by using Arrow or different techniques, which are pretty pretty cool in my opinion. Um, yeah, there are a couple of talks already provided also in the official documentation recorded from CollinConf and other events, which are also very didactic. And I think that's most likely everything. There's, it's worth mentioning Mario's book. So Mario has published a book called uh, Functional Programming in Kotlin. And oh. it comes from a perspective, yeah, it comes from a perspective of somebody ha- that has been doing, uh, I have a, I can drop the link later, but basically from the perspective of somebody that has been doing functional programming in Scala, has been dropped into, co- into Kotlin, has Arrow available. So it's already updated. Uh, he already based it in Functional, but he updated it with all the stuff that we had added. So that's also a really oh, good cool. entry point. Yeah. So at this point, uh, we want to thank you all so much for coming on. We'll make sure to like all the resources that you mentioned, uh, we'll definitely, for the sake of our listeners, we'll definitely drop in uh, the show notes, uh, all the stuff that you mentioned. But I imagine our listeners, you know, as they get started out, they would also basically want to maybe like, you know, reach out to you folks. So maybe we can go around the room and uh, sort of like if 
if folks wanted to reach out to you and ask more questions, what would be a good way to do that, right? Paco, can you, uh, or Francisco, as I hear is your name, <laughs> would you like to get us started? Oh, 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 oh. I know, right? My first two talks were just like Francisco, and I was like, that feels so weird. Everybody calls me Paco since forever. Um, yeah, so I am Paco Works, uh, twitter.com slash Paco Works or Paco.works, which is the, it's the blog. And also on Gitter. So if you go to the ROKT website, uh, you're going to see on the bottom right saying, hey, start a chat. And that's actually us. We're there pretty much 24-7. So, well, 24-7 Europe time <laughs> anyway. But, but yeah, you can ask us questions there. Fantastic. Uh, and Jorge, uh, how do we reach out to you? Uh, you can find me most likely on Twitter. I spend a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. So you can find me by Jorge Castillo PR. So just ask me about anything you need. I will be willing to answer any doubts you have. And you can also find me on the official Codling Slack, which is, uh, I think it's uh, Codling Lang, mm-hmm. possibly. I'm not sure. I think it's Codling Lang. Yeah, yeah we'll have a link. Yeah. Okay. So you can find me there also. Yeah, same here. I'm also in the Codling Slack and on Twitter, I'm Raul Raja. So just feel free to hit me up with any questions. Excellent. And Don, if folks want to reach out to you and find out uh, a new definition for monads. What's a good way to do it? <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter and Instagram with the same handle, which is at Don Felker. And what about you, Kaushik? How can folks I get a hold of Kaushik you? I am Kaushik Gopal on Twitter and uh, on Instagram as well. Thank you all so much for listening. The I want to like Don and I want to extend a special special thanks to the Arrow folks. Like they've been so good about this. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a selfless effort. Like they're taking this topic, which is admittedly a very complex topic, but like you guys have been doing a fantastic job of like disseminating that information, coming up with resources, and uh, the community greatly, greatly thanks all the work that uh, you've been doing. Hey, thanks for you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. And also for having us here today. Our pleasure. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, and we will catch you all in the next episode. Hey, I'm back. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to automatically build, test, and release your Android apps? If so, then you got to try App Center. You can connect your repo and within minutes you can build in the cloud, test on thousands of real Android devices, distribute to beta testers, and monitor real world usage with crash and analytics data. You know that sounds good. Don't deny it. Spend less time managing your app lifecycle and more time coding. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, then you're listening to the wrong podcast, my friend. Visit appcenter.ms and get started for free. That's again, appcenter.ms. Thanks again, Microsoft. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.